muted. Well, good evening, everyone. Tonight's week three of the Beginner's Guide to VHF and UHF. I'm Anthony Luskery, K8CT. And I'm Marty Wall, N6 Victor, India. This is my contact information. Here's Marty's contact information. And the slideshow is at tiny.cc slash bgvhf, beginner vhf. Uh, tonight's topics, we're going to talk about where you can where you can talk to with your VHF UHF, two meter simplex, uh, some single sideband VHF UHF, uh, satellites, a repeater crawl, six meters, 220 UHF and microwaves, uh, VHF UHF uh, <coughs> rover installation, uh, VHF UHF contesting, and contest roving. So first of all, where can you talk with your VHF UHF? Well, I broke it down into three categories based on what mode you're using or what propagation uh, uh, feature you're taking advantage of. Local contacts can be made with FM simplex on VHF or UHF um, and with repeaters. These are pretty much line of sight uh, type of contacts on these. Regional contacts can be made by uh, linking various repeaters together so they cover wider regions. Using single sideband and or FT8 on VHF, six meters and two meters, so-called weak signal modes, also CW, will increase your distances somewhat. Uh, for long distance contacts on six meters, it acts a lot like HF at sometimes with sunspot F2 activity ionizing the layer and producing uh, worldwide propagation at times. Unfortunately, we don't always have good sunspot activity, but even when we don't, we get sporadic E. This is the E layer that's ionized, and we don't really know exactly why it happens or when it's going to happen very well. But it can provide regional and sometimes uh, even long distance uh, communications on six meters. Hence the name Magic Band because these sporadic E can pop up and you can all of a sudden go from contact across town to someone in the Caribbean. On the VHF UHF bands, there's a number of what I'll refer to as EPPs, Enhanced Propagation Phenomena. These include tropospheric ducting. These are when you hear about the contacts between Hawaii and, and California on VHF, UHF bands, a meteor scatter, aurora, transequatorial TEP, also it's abbreviated, something called aircraft enhancement. Uh, another form of bouncing things off would be bouncing them off the moon with EME, Earth, Moon, Earth. Also, we can utilize satellites, or we can use internet backbone VHF, UHF uh, connections. So we're not doing purely radio here. We're adding in a backbone using the internet, things like Echolink, DMR, DSTAR, et cetera. Let's take a real quick look at some of the enhanced propagation phenomena. And this is a pretty good site on that. Um, this site is from DX Maps, which is one of the places you're going to want to hang out if you do get into VHF, UHF, weak signal activity. They talk about tropospheric ducting. They talk about tropospheric scatter, sporadic E, meteor scatter, uh, field aligned irregularities, uh, aurora, moon bounce, inter ionospheric scattering, and transequatorial or TEP. Um, also, I have a link here for information on aircraft enhancement. And a little earlier this evening, I was installing this program, but I haven't got it completely installed to play with it. But this is where we actually use aircraft to uh, refract the signals back to Earth uh, from a airplane up in the sky. So it's a way of bouncing signals off an airplane as opposed to moon bounce. So uh, this uh, information is available. This website has the information. You can download it. It's called Sharper Aircraft Scatter or something like that. I can't remember the exact name of the program, but you can uh, grab that if you're interested in that sort of thing. So there's a wide variety of places you can talk to, not just across town on the local repeater. Let's cover Simplex FM first. Uh, it's good practice for emergency comm because your local repeater might be down or you might be in an area with no repeater. It often doesn't require a new radio, all the things we talked about in weeks one and two. By the way, those are available as recordings. It gives you a chance to experiment with antennas, amps, etc. to increase your simplex range. Many local clubs and organizations hold two meter FM simplex contests on a regular basis. Often they're grid square based. Uh, because that allows you to tell uh, pretty much how far you're contacting. And I have some videos here on FM Simplex. 
The FM simplex frequency to monitor is 146.520. I just turned mine off so it won't be on in the background here. Uh, FM simplex, you would just say, okay, I'll just turn my radio on. I'm not going to pick a repeater frequency. I'll just pick a random frequency. Well, don't do that. Use one of the suggested frequencies, and the suggestions vary by the part of the country you're in. If you're in the east, you're going to want to use the yellow uh, chart. If you're in the, the far west, with the exception of California, you're going to want to use the purple chart. If you're in Alabama, uh, Alaska, other places, you're going to have to check on your local conditions because they're different. But basically, the yellow is 15 kilohertz uh, channelization and or spacing, and the, the purple is 20. There are some frequencies that are shared by both groups. So if you look at this 146.40, 146.40. And again, these are not the repeater inputs or outputs, so you won't be interfering with repeaters. And especially don't go down to the bottom of the band where there's weak signal activity going on. You should not be using FM below uh, the 146.40 uh, area. In addition to a uh, single six meter single sideband, you can also do single sideband on VHF and UHF bands, two meters, 440, et cetera. It's mainly used for weak signal work, contesting, and for some satellites, the so-called linear transponder satellites use a single sideband. We'll talk a little bit more about satellites in a few slides. Yeah, let me, oh, Anthony, let me yes. jump in real quickly and uh, mention uh, in terms of uh, finding uh, frequencies to use. Um, each area has a frequency coordinator it's a volunteer group of amateurs, and they usually come up with a, a, a coordination plan or a band plan for your region. And that region, for example, Southern California is one. You may have uh, a whole state or several states, especially in the east, uh, northeast. Uh, you have uh, a coordinator that uh, basically uh, they, they try to maintain order by not having people put repeaters on top of each other unless they're uh, physically separated by terrain and or with uh, with uh, separate PL tones and so on. They also designate frequencies for uh, certain digital activities uh, such as, uh, you know, Avara FM and uh, and uh, packet work. Uh, usually there's uh, there's maybe a frequency that's used for uh, transmitter hunting and so on. So please take a look at, you know, find your local uh, coordinator. Uh, you can find a list if, if uh, you have one of the ARL repeater directories, there's a list of coordinators in the front by band. And, and some we, coordinators handle just one band, some handle multiple bands. But yeah, if you go back to week one in our slideshow, I talked about the various band plans, mm -hmm. including a link for uh, some of the uh, different band plans that are recommended. So take right. a look at this repeaterbook.com wiki that has a listing by each of the states. So you can simply go in there and you can follow through for your state. So please do not just grab those frequencies and just punch something in. Go and check what the situation is in your particular state. Yeah, and you know, there's some radios where you get them out of the box, you turn them on and they start down in the sideband area or something and they really shouldn't. I mean, you know, that's, that's a bad way to, for default program those things but you know you don't just turn it on and start talking yeah and by the way the bottom one 144.0 to 144.1 is cw only by rule so that's not even a matter of a gentleman's agreement by band plan that is an actually an fcc rule both on two meters and six meters there and on 222 there are actually f uh CW only segments at the bottom of the band, so you definitely don't want to get into those because then you'll be breaking FCC rules, not just um, the local band plan. Thank you, Marty. Um, K0NR has a really good uh, information on getting started on two-meter single sideband. He has a book on VHF summits and more. He does VHF uh, summits on the air, but he also has some information on two meter single sideband. He actually come in, he actually came and spoke to our club via Zoom uh, early in the pandemic, and that was great. Single sideband activity typically uses horizontally polarized antennas versus vertical polarization on most of the FM antennas. And if you're close in and having direct line of sight communication, you will get significant attenuation if your antenna is not polarized the same way. So just be aware of that. If you're trying to do single sideband and you're using your two meter FM antenna, you might not get quite as good as results as you're expecting. And you remember back on uh, week in the week two, we talked about different kinds of antennas you can build 
Um, and you can build, some of them are, are buildable for either horizontal or vertical polarization. Exactly. So the next thing we're going to talk about is satellites in space. With the rare exception of a few older HF satellites, all satellite privileges are available to technicians. So um, it's a great place for starters actually to get involved. And it's one of the first things I did when I got my license, I got involved with satellites. Um, at that time, I wasn't a technician, but I had, excuse me, I had my uh, license and was able to operate on the satellites. There are five bases, I'm going to say six types of satellites. I left one off the list here. I keep leaving it off. Uh, low Earth orbit uh, satellites that are FM based. These are probably the easiest satellites to use, and I'll talk more about those in a few minutes. Low Earth orbit linear transponder satellites. These are ones that use single sideband and CW. High Earth orbit linear transponders. This is what I cut my teeth on Oscar 10, for example, in a high elliptical orbit. Unfortunately, there are no high elliptical orbit satellites available currently for amateurs. Uh, geosynchronous orbits, and a satellite that stays in the same place. You don't have to track it. You know where it's approximately going to be. Um, there are none in the Western Hemisphere. The only uh, geosynchronous satellite is in AIRU Region 1. That's Europe and Africa. Uh, so we don't have a geosynchronous satellite in our area. And of course, the space station at some times is turned on as a digirepeater, so it acts very similar to a satellite. Low Earth orbit FM satellites are a great starting point for new satellite operators. They're easier to use than the linear transponder satellites. They can often use your existing dual band HT, mobile, or other FM capable radio. So you might not even need to buy a new radio. Compact, inexpensive gain antennas can be used. This young lady here is using what's called an aero antenna. It's a commercial antenna. What you can't see is in the plane uh, facing us, there's actually two meter elements on this. So you can see the 440 elements, but there's actually two meter elements coming towards us here that we can't see. This is an aero antenna. It's great uh, to explore with young operators. People who just get their tech license, you can get them a long distance communication by using satellites. Uh, Sean uh, Kutzko, KX9X, has a great series on satellites. He wrote six blog posts and then he recorded YouTube videos on each of these also. So it's a great place to start out learning about satellites and just watching the one on basics of satellites and getting started on FM satellites would be a really good step if you're interested. Here you can see that he's using an aero antenna and you can see the two meter elements. So basically the components for using low earth orbit, low earth orbit FM satellites are a dual band capable two meter and 440 or two separate radios, uh, two meter radio and a 440 radio. It can be an FM HT mobile or other radio, uh, a base station like the FT991, uh, the small portable QRP, Yesu FT-818. I actually use the older version, the 817 for my satellite station, ICOM 705. All of these would be suitable radios. Um, you need a commercial or a do-it-yourself do satellite antenna. So the Aero antenna is about $125. There's also the Elk antennas, which are very similar to the Aero antennas. Um, and they're not very expensive either. These are commercial antennas that are well established, but you can build your own. You could build a simple uh, Moxon. There's also something called the $4 ham radio satellite antenna. So if you just wanna get started and you don't wanna spend a lot of money, grab your HT, build a $4 antenna. And then there's even a modification uh, website to improve your $4 antenna. One of the things you're gonna to need to do with satellites though, is you're gonna to have to figure out when and where in the sky the satellite is gonna be. The satellites are in constant orbit with the exception of those geosynchronous satellites that we don't have access to. So you're going to need to track them. In the olden days, this often involved installing software, listening for what's called Keplerian elements that you have to plug into your uh, software. But most of this now can be accomplished on the internet, either downloading the Keplerian elements or even using a website such as Heaven Above or N2YO uh, to track your satellites. So you can simply go on these sites Pick the satellites you want to track, put in your location, and you can view what satellites are going to be available when and where above you. I bumped the mouse there. So uh, this will let you know when the satellite's going to be passing over, what direction to point your antenna, because you do need to um, get your gain in that direction. Now, these are not very powerful satellites. And there's a whole lot of rules for using them. You don't want to overpower the satellite or other people won't be able to use it. So make sure you go through and 
I, I suggest you go through KX9X's uh, good primer on satellites. So moving on from satellites, let's talk a little bit about VHF, UHF alternative repeater activities. Uh, we said we're talking about getting away from repeaters, but there are some things you can do with repeaters that are sort of fun and neat to do. There's a group up in Michigan that, that started this thing they called a repeater crawl. It's similar to a, a pub crawl where you go and drink alcohol to a number of different establishments. In this case, there's no alcohol involved. You simply check into different repeaters, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You can also have weekly training nets on your uh, local repeater. Um, you can have internet backbone modes to connect different repeaters such as Echolink, DMR, DSTAR, or even uh, linking them via VHF or UHF links. So this is the weekly repeater crawl. Uh, Keith Armitage uh, is the one that sent me this information. On a specified night, participants check into a number of local repeaters in a specified order, like a pub crawl. With a live online log, uh, they use NetLogger, which is really good because everyone can see that on their computer and know who else is on the, the repeater crawl with them. Hamster are encouraged to try new repeaters, program repeaters into the radio memories, uh, set the proper PL uh, encode and decode tones, and test to see whether they can actually hit different repeaters that they might not have even known were in their area. And this is a great way to see what repeaters can be accessed from your location or if you're mobile, what repeaters you can bring up. In addition to 2 meters and 440, you could also include other repeaters on less common bands such as 222, 6 meters, 10 meters, and 1.2 gigahertz, etc. So let's talk a little bit now about six meters. Six meters is called the magic band. And a lot of the things I'm going to talk about with six meters also apply to HF. So it's really a VHF band, but it acts a lot like an HF band a lot of the time. All US hams uh, with technician class licenses or above have full privileges on six meters. Six meters can provide regional and even DX when conditions are favorable. Most newer HF radios already include six meters, so you don't need to buy a separate radio if you have an HF radio already. And again, as I talked about in the one of the two previous weeks, I have a whole session on buying amateur radio equipment. Uh, gain antennas are easily manageable in size, but even a dipole or a simple J-pole will also work on six meters. Single sideband and digital modes, FT8 and FT4, are most popular, but there's also CW and FM, both single sideband, I'm sorry, both Simpex and six meter repeaters. I have some six meter resources for you here. There's a free ebook that you can download from K5ND. You can also go to KN5, K5ND's website. This is uh, Jim Wilson here at K5ND. Um, also a link on six meter antennas, uh, building a six meter moxon, and a six meter coaxial dipole antenna, AKA the flower pot antenna, which I mentioned a little earlier in one of our earlier weeks. I'm going to pass this over to Marty now uh, and let him talk a little bit about the upper bands because I don't have a lot of experience. I did do a little bit of 220 and I've done a little bit of 440, but on the microwaves, I have very little experience. And part of that is because it is somewhat regional. There's a lot more activity on the East Coast than in California. So I'll turn this over to Marty for just some brief information on this. Okay, very good. Thanks, Anthony. Um, yes, I have been very active in VHF, UHF, and microwave contesting for probably 15 to 20 years. And we've been, uh, we've been roving, we've been, we'll talk about roving. Uh, I've operated from home, I've operated from mountaintops, uh, everything up through uh, 24 gigahertz, which is 24,000 megahertz. And it never ceases to amaze me uh, how low power and modest antennas can reach some really significant distances. Um, uh, just by way of illustration from one mountaintop in uh, Southern California on 10 gigahertz, which is 10,000 megahertz with a little two foot dish and two watts. I talked uh, repeatedly into Arizona, into Nevada, up as far as Mount Shasta in Northern California and pretty much everywhere in between. So once you get above two meters, um, the bands are typically much less crowded uh, other than uh, 440 FM. And the uh, sideband sections that Anthony mentioned earlier, the weak signal areas are also much less crowded. And uh, it's, you know, sideband is a much more efficient mode uh, than uh, FM in that you can have a weaker signal and still 
uh, be able to understand the other person. It's not lost in, in squelch noise, uh, which is one of the reasons they call it weak signal modes. And of course, Morse code is uh, a real champ in terms of working. Uh, that's a lot of my work from, uh, uh, from up on Fraser Peak, uh, working into, uh, and, and also down in the San Joaquin Valley, working uh, across the mountains into, into Nevada has been on CW. And it, it, I'll tell you, it's, it makes it really easy. Um, you don't have to go fast, but being able to tell that carrier's on or off is a lot easier than trying to uh, decode a human voice. Uh, 220 has some really nice propagation. It's a little like two meters, but it, it's, it's not exactly. Uh, when we've done uh, groups of rovers uh, going, you know, seven, eight, 900 miles during a contest weekend to activate different grid locators, <clears throat> uh, we found that 220 is usually our liaison band with various other fixed stations. Uh, that's because its propagation is uh, at least as good as two meters and often better. And the antennas are only about two thirds the size, so you can get a reasonable amount of gain there. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, all these bands have more room and, and fewer people. Uh, so uh, it's good for experimentation. Uh, but as the slide says, you need other operators. Uh, the best time to try that is when a lot of people are on the air and uh, as, especially those going out to uh, advantageous locations such as mountaintops or roving into various areas that are otherwise sparsely populated. At least out here, we have a lot of areas that are very sparsely populated. Unless somebody goes there for purpose of uh, a contest operation, you're not gonna hear them or work them. Uh, Anthony's got a nice link here. Anthony, you want to tell them what that is? Yes, this is a link on using uh, the VHF, the uh, microwaves and UHF, and hopefully it's going to load here. While it's loading, um, in addition to contesting in that area, there's also, oh, I'll have to fix the link. I'm sorry, I will fix the link. Um, in addition to uh, contesting, there's also activity uh, periods, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about VHF, UHF contesting, and how uh, the UHF and microwaves can fit into that. So let's jump right into that. VHF, UHF contesting in many ways is similar to HF contesting. We have quick exchanges, you know, signal report or a multiplier that you might give out. In most cases, we use the grid square uh, for VHF, UHF contest. And typically, we not only use the, uh, on some of the contests, we'll use the four character. But for example, I'm EN91. But in some cases, we'll use the six character grid square, which digs down even closer so you can tell exactly where in the grid you're at. So I am EN91HE, and I have a whole uh, article that I wrote for our local newsletter on finding your grid square and finding other hams in your area. Now, the finding other hams in your area was not has nothing to do with the grid squares, but it's what you end up finding when you use the grid square method. So it talks about the grid square, what grid squares are, how they work. Uh, the designator so this is what i was talking about the first two characters the second two numbers and the next two characters are what are you typically used uh, to give you a good idea of where you're at on a this location. is formally known as the uh, maidenhead yes. grid locator system and the entire world is is divided up into fields like dm and em and el and so on and then from there into uh into uh 24 uh, 24 segments uh, vertically and uh, the 12 horizontally. And then from there, it's all, or, and then from there into, uh, into, you know, smaller and smaller units. So it's, it's, uh, we say grid squares as, as a, you know, but it's really grid locators. And uh, typically four characters, as Anthony says, in the VHF contest, in the microwave contest, Often they're scored based on distance. So you use uh, six characters. For example, I'm in Delta Mike 04, but that covers a lot of Southern California. But uh, Delta Mike 04, Quebec, Germany describes just a few, uh, you know, a fraction of a mile in either direction of me. And uh, on the basis of that, we can calculate uh, the distance from one to another and therefore the number of points you'll earn. And the grid squares are lettered from west to east. So uh, the West Coast will be C's and D's. Uh, the East Coast will be F's. The other letters are ran from north, so I'm sorry, from south to north. So you can find your grid square by using the information in this link 
uh, and it will also help you find other people. So there's a couple different websites I have. This one lets you go out and find your square by putting in your address or your zip code. I can put in my zip code here and it will bring up my grid square. And if I put in my address, it would even narrow it down more. I'm in this part of the grid square right over here. Actually, I am in the, this part of the grid square right over here. So this is EN91GE. I'm in HE, so H would be to the east of G. So I'm in EN91GHE. So this will help you find your information on your grid square. There's a variety of sources. There's apps you can use for your phone. I talk about those in that article. There's also a variety of modes used for contesting, including single sideband, CW. FT8 and FT4 are really taken off on the six meter contesting, especially, although I did work some FT8 this last weekend uh, on two meters during the uh, CQ uh, Worldwide VHF UHF. I put together a little chart here that shows uh, some frequencies. When you're contesting, uh, you can sort of get lost on the band. There's a lot of space on some of these bands and all the contesters are hanging out in one general area. So what I've done is I've included a calling frequency for single side band, but then a range to call. You don't want to just call them the calling frequency. You need to spread out a little bit. So typically most of the six meter single side band activity during a contest, of course, will take place between 50.125 and 50.250. The area from 50.1 to 50.125 is considered a DX window. So you don't typically as a US station call in that area. That's reserved for DX stations to call. Uh, similar with two meters, uh, here's the calling frequency, but here's the range. Same thing with 70 centimeters. There's also CW ranges to operate in. And there's quite often a lot of activity during on CW, especially on, sing, on six meters during contest. So contest usually allow FM also, and if FM is allowed, here's the calling frequency, and then uh, for six meters, and there's a range of uh, additional frequencies, which I don't have on here, but I will add them to this slide. Because we're doing a little contest with our local club, and we're gonna be doing six meter FM as our contest mode for our local club activity, so I have all the six meter simplex frequencies listed. And let, me, meter, let me mention something yes. on, on uh, calling frequencies. Um, when the band is quiet and there's not much going on, that's a good place to put out some calls because if anybody else is listening, that's probably where they're listening and you may catch the opening. But if the band starts to heat up, uh, it is really considered bad practice to sit there and monopolize uh, the calling frequency because uh, there may be people on there you can't hear who are trying to work other people and you're interfering with them. So, you know, if you start getting a run going, usually what you'll do is you'll move up. And uh, on six meters, they tend to go in five kilohertz increments just because it kind of keeps people separated. So, you know, uh, if I start getting a bunch of people, I know other people want to use the calling frequency on six meters. I may say, okay, N6VI is going up to uh, 135 or 145, somewhere I've taken a quick listen on the other VFO to determine that the frequency seems clear. The other thing you'll find is you think you have a clear frequency, especially, this is especially true on six meters. Uh, Anthony mentioned it's the magic band. Propagation can come and go in a matter of seconds sometimes. <clears throat> and you'll hear this loud station in Texas or something. And then next thing you know, they're gone. So, uh, you know, it may be that you're sitting there running stations and having a, a real good run up on uh, 140 or 145 on six meters. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody says, hey, the, you know, I've, I've been on this frequency for a long time. Well, they probably have, and you have too. It's just there was no propagation between the two, and all of a sudden there is. So you have to get used to suddenly, uh, you know, accommodating somebody else, and, uh, you know, uh, somebody, somebody's going to have to move. So get used to that. It's just, it's part of the, uh, it's part of the protocol. And on um, FT8 and FT4, because they're time sequenced, if you if everyone's calling on the same time sequence, even or odd, no one will hear anyone. So there's a there's a general uh, agreement that when you're calling on FT8, if you're calling CQ to the east of you, you call on the odd. If you're calling to the west of you, you call on the even. So for example, if I'm trying to work Europeans on FT8, I'd be calling to the east. So I would call CQ on the odd time sequence. If I'm trying to work Hawaii, I'd call CQ on the even because I'm working to the east. Now, of course, you still need to alternate somewhat or no one's gonna work each other if you're not far enough east or far enough west. But uh, that is something that's done on FT8 on six meters and above. Um, to do that east-west type of 
of consideration. So again, we want to get people to find each other, but we don't want them to prevent other people from making contact. So please be reasonable, and I'll upgrade this chart with the uh, FM frequencies here, and I'll also show you a little bit about the contest we're doing this fall. The biggest differences from HF contesting on VHF, UHF contesting, probably the number one thing is QSYing. After working a station on one band, you often hear a request for the, from the station you're talking to asking you what other bands you have and do you want a QSY. Typically, QSYing starts at the lowest band and works its way up. But if you're making a contact on 430, uh, you might say you'll start on 6 and then work your way back up again if you have all of these bands. It depends what bands you have. So if I work someone on 6, they might say, do you have 2 meters? And we'll agree on a frequency and we'll both jump up there and make a contact. And he'll say, do you have 220? I'll say no. He said, okay, let's go up to 432.1. I'll go up there and work them there. He'll say, do you have 1.2 gigahertz? I'll say no. And he'll say, oh, Thank you for the contacts, and then he'll move on to call someone else. So QSYing is a very popular way to increase the number of contacts you have and increase the bands that you're working during a VHF UH contest, something that typically doesn't happen in HF contest. Another thing that's very common in VHF UHF contest is roving. This happens a little bit in HF contest, mainly during stake QSO parties where people are moving from county to county. But it's much easier to rove on VHF UHF contests because the antennas are smaller. So moving from one grid to another uh, is a great way to increase the contacts. And um, we'll be talking more about roving a little bit later. Openings are often much shorter and variable in VHF UHF contests. So sometimes you only have a few minutes to make contacts. So you want to be even quicker and, and very efficient. Uh, Often they're much friendlier contacts, though, and hence the helping people out, you know, do you, you want to QS, QSY to another band to make more contacts. There's major uh, VHF, UHF contests in the U.S. First of all, I'm going to tell you, unfortunately, in the U.S., we don't have as many contests as in Europe. There's a lot more VHF, UHF contesting in Europe than there is in the United States. The U.S. has four main VHF, UHF contests, the AWRL January, AWRL June, the CQ Worldwide VHF contest, which was last weekend in July, and the AWRL September contest, so you can all get ready for the September contest. For more VHF UHF contests and activity days and nets, N2SLN has a contest calendar out there, and um, he has a lot of information in this starting in January and going through December. So there's a whole variety of things here. Some of these, of course, you're not going to be have very much luck working. Other ones might be in your area. Um, some of the contest groups, uh, such as Smirk, aren't as active as they used to be, and their website's not up now, so I'm not sure if they're still running this contest in June that they used to run. But uh, you'll also see these sprints. These sprints are very common. They're more of activity-type things as opposed to a, a true contest uh, where people get on. So the microwave sprints, the 2-meter sprint, the, the 220 sprint. There's also activity weeks for some of these different uh, modes and bands. Most activity is single sideband and FT8 and FT4, but there's also some CW, especially on 6 meters and 2 meters, and there's some FM on 2 meters and 70 centimeters. And, you know, if, if you're in a, in a heavily populated area, you may find that there's a lot of activity on FM, particularly yes. since, uh, uh, at least for some of the ARO contests, they have a category for FM only. So even people who have some sideband capability will restrict their activity to FM. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, you're going to find that it could be, uh, you know, two thirds of your contacts are on FM. So, you know, make sure that you uh, make sure that you have as many modes as you can available. Yes, definitely. Some contests have higher point values for working the higher frequency bands. Um, just as the opposite of what happens on some HF contests, some HF contests have higher point scores for working 40, 80, and 160. Like WPX. Well, the harder bands to work in this case are the higher bands, so some contests have higher values for those. Check the rules concerning the use of established calling frequency. Some contests do not allow you to actually use the designated calling frequency, so 146.52 is not allowed in some contests, so make sure you check the rules on that. Also, check the rules on assistant operating use of spotting. Most VHF, UHF contests do allow spotting, but just check to make sure. Um, introduction to a double. If you're not, if you're, I'm sorry, if you're new to contesting completely, uh, I did a set of six classes for the AWRL um, 
an introduction to contesting. I also did a, a slideshow presentation. There's a video recording of it. You can view the slideshow or the video recording without being a member of the AWRL. But if you want to take the class, you need to be a member of the uh, AWRL. But there is a free trial that you can get if you want to take some classes. And there's a variety of classes there. When you click on this link, it'll bring you out to the Learning Center and it'll show you the various courses that are available. And uh, you can go through these courses on contesting so it's a great way to get started in contesting if you're new to it also there was an article that i had in cq magazine two months ago uh, on beginning contesting all right uh anthony shall i take it from here yeah go ahead okay um you're wondering we've been talking a lot about contesting why why should you even care why should you even do that uh the first answer is it's a lot of fun uh, generally, during a contest, you will have a lot more activity on the bands than you will on a typical weekday or even a weekend. Uh, you'll get the rag chewing going on on local repeaters and maybe some simplex frequencies, but there are lots of folks out there who are uh, who activate their stations and and or uh, get up to a higher location, maybe a mountaintop or are roving among different locations. Uh, there are awards that you can get for. Uh, working uh, certain numbers of grid locators in diff on different bands. Uh, I happen to have the, the, the endorsed VUCC awards on two, three, five, and 10 gigahertz um, uh, just from my uh, roving activities and some of the mountaintop activities. Um, it's good copy practice. Uh, you know, we encourage well, whether you're in, uh, uh, whether you're in the emergency communication side of things or not, it's really a good idea to build your ability to uh, hear and copy down things that are unfamiliar, uh, call signs that not the same ones you hear on the net every week, grid locators, and so on. So it's good practice uh, to uh, go from your ear down to either your, your uh, paper log or to the computer log that you're going to be using. Uh, if you are chasing awards, uh, just like on HF, uh, contests are a great way to work some of those locations that may not be active during the normal uh, non-contest times uh, <clears throat> or yeah, either because the people aren't on or because there's nobody in there. Out here in the West, particularly, we have grid locators that have almost no stations in them unless somebody goes there and activates it. Uh, not so much so in the uh, Northeast. Um, it al contesting allows you to evaluate your station's performance. Uh, if, uh, if you find other people around you are working a certain person and you're not, maybe that says something about your setup uh, also, if you make changes from uh, one uh, contest period to the next one, you can evaluate, hey, you know, last time I did this, I couldn't work San Diego on 1.2 gigahertz. Now I can. OK, so you can tell whether that uh, your station is more effective and how evaluate those changes. Uh, you will experience, particularly on six meters, but really on quite a few of the bands, uh, because they're all subject to uh, tropospheric ducting. Um, uh, you will experience changes in propagation. Maybe certain times of the day uh, work better than others. Sometimes we find that the middle of the night can be really good for uh, microwaves going up into the San Joaquin Valley, for example, or the, the, the tropo ducting, which is really uh, weather related, uh, <clears throat> uh, occurs in early morning hours or it peaks in the evening hours. Uh, you'll find out what works in your area by being on the air a lot. And this is just, just like it is on HF, um, but it's a little more transitory and often a little less predictable. Um, if you want to get involved in contesting, you don't have to be competitive. You don't even have to send in a log, although we encourage you to do that. Again, keeping the log is good practice for you. And it also tells the contest sponsors how many people were, were on and active and uh, it, it, they actually compare your log with other logs so that you can determine how accurately you recorded what you heard and what you exchanged. Uh, you can just get on for a few hours, uh, a little bit of time, or you can go what we call BIC, butt in chair, uh, as much time as you can during the contest period, uh, up to the maximum allowed for you as a single operator. Uh, other people are investing time and money and, and so on in, in getting out to these remote locations and activating them, sort of like little mini de-expeditions. 
And uh, if they get out there and nobody's calling them, I mean, it's, it's really discouraging. And I've seen rovers get very discouraged because of that. But if you get on, you're going to hand out those contacts. They're going to want to talk to you. You're going to make people happy. You're going to make some new friends. You're going to learn about uh, their stations and what they're doing. So it's really good. And as Anthony mentioned earlier, a technician license is plenty. Uh, uh, all the bands from six meters on up uh, are full access, full power to every level of licensee. Um, and uh, the VHF, UHF antennas, as he mentioned, are smaller than they are for HF. Therefore, they're easier to transport. I'll show you in a little while uh, a picture of one of my setups. Um, and so you can, get the, you can get a reasonable antenna system up to a portable location all sitting in a car. You don't have to have a tower and everything else. Um, it gives you a good reason to go try and visit a high spot, whether it's the, uh, the, the roof of a, you know, the parking structure of a, of a, a hospital or uh, whether it's a hilltop or a mountaintop or uh, someplace, someplace with a, a little more uh, line of sight. Uh, you see what you do there compared with home. Uh, if you find some of these good locations, uh, that might be good to know in case you have a, a disaster where you have to get on and you can't reach the areas you need to reach from home, but you, you know you can reach them uh, from up on this uh, parking structure or up on this hilltop. Uh, again, you don't have to send in a log. Uh, it's encouraged to do that. And uh, there, are, there are specific formats for those logs, which kind of make it uh, uniform for the uh, sponsors to deal with. Uh, cool. And as I mentioned, other hams will definitely appreciate your getting on and giving them the contact. And if you can give them, uh, they say, hey, you know, we'll work. I have three bands. You work them on all three bands. They'll be really appreciative and they'll remember that. I was in New Mexico for a conference and I had a, I arrived there on a Sunday and I didn't, conference didn't start until Monday. And I had my uh, Yesu 817 and the rubber duck antenna that comes with it. Now it covers six meters, but all I had was my little rubber duck. But I figured out by going out on the balcony of the hotel I was staying on, I could use the railings as reflectors and directors. And I made contacts on six meters into 18 different states uh, from Albuquerque out. And I sent my log in and I got back a couple months later, first place uh, QRP in the New Mexico section. So always send your log in. You never know when you're going to get an, an award. Uh, here's some resources on VHF UHF contesting and again you're going to have to invest some time after this go through the go through the slides click on all the links there's a lot of really good links here on contesting with VHF UHF and just contesting in general and here is the uh, CQ magazine it was the June 2022 issue in the ham radio explorer column on contesting and it talks about amateur radio contesting in general but a lot of things that are applicable to uh, the VHF, UHF uh, included in that. Again, some more uh, resources, including PSK Reporter that lets you see where your signal's being heard, uh, VHF, UHF beacons, uh, cluster sites that have uh, spots. All right, let's talk about roving for a minute. Uh, in many of the contests, uh, uh, your score is based on the the contact points, that is uh, how many points per, per contact on two meters and six meters, and then you get more points maybe on 220 and 432 and more on 900 and 1200 and more on the microwave bands. And uh, that accumulation of points is multiplied by the number of grid locators that you log on each of those bands that you're operating. Uh, well, if there are, uh, say out where we are, there are some operations where uh, they visit locations that normally aren't active and uh in a weekend i've been able to rove uh, this is an old setup i i have uh, modified it since then uh, but i have uh, 10 bands on my vehicle uh six meters through 10 gigahertz although now it'll be nine because we just lost most of three gigahertz and uh, with that i can cover hundreds and hundreds of miles i can stop in different grid locators and each time i do uh, everybody available, I can work them again, and I can give them a new uh, multiplier, and it counts again for me as another contact. Uh, so uh, as opposed to sitting in one place, it's great to be up on a mountaintop and work everybody, but the rovers are out there, and, and they'll want to work you. If, if you're at a good location, they're going to want to work as many people as they can at each stop, and they'll do it in kind of a hurry. 
So uh, it it becomes uh, it becomes a real challenge for both op uh, operators on both ends. But it also leads to some very efficient and quick contacts. You work people one band all, all the way up. Uh, I've I've uh, gotten and worked people on ten bands in a matter of uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, and again, the more bands you can use, uh, the higher your score, the more other people you'll be able to contact and the more folks you'll make happy. Uh, this particular setup uh, and all my setups for mobile, I have a rotator on a platform on the roof and uh, I, can, I can park at a location uh, quickly, uh, use my uh, declination adjusted compass to orient the vehicle north south. And then my rotator uh, dial indicator is accurate within a couple of degrees. And especially as you get up into the microwave bands, you want that accuracy. Uh, use a, a, a quick a little uh, a microcomputer program to determine the bearing between you, where you are and the grid locator of the other person and uh, maximize and peak the signal. Next. Um, when you're going mobile, um, uh, we encourage you to go back to the presentation I made on safe, effective vehicle-based operations. Um, we talked about uh, setting up your station, the, the powering it, uh, coax, uh, safe, safe practices, and so on. So I encourage you to go back if you haven't and uh, or take a look at that. And also the K0 Bravo Golf site, k0bg.com. Alan has a phenomenal setup of uh, uh, articles on dozens and dozens of topics related to mobile operation. Um, Anthony mentioned activity days. Uh, the uh, Central States VHF Society uh, has a, uh, a series of spring sprints and fall sprints. Usually it's uh, four hours, like 7 to 11 p.m. local. On, uh, uh, on a Monday, they'll have uh, uh, two meters uh, the next week, it'll be Tuesday on 220. The next week, it'll be Wednesday on uh, 70 centimeters. And then they'll have typically a weekend day that is for all the 900 on up. And then they'll have another weekend day for six meters. Um, and uh, the ARL 10 gigahertz contest, uh, it's 10 gigahertz and up. Uh, that's one I've operated quite a few times and a lot of fun. Um, uh, and you would be amazed at how many stations get on the air and, and uh, some of them get up to some uh, really excellent locations. A lot of rovers out there. Uh, it's amazing what you can work up on the microwave bands with low power. Now, it obviously takes more specialized equipment. We usually use what are called transverters, which uh, take a signal uh, from one band and move it up to another one and the same in the reverse. So uh, I may have a radio on the, uh, a two meter all band radio, uh, all mode radio, and I can use that. And it, my signal, when I talk, my signal comes out on uh, 10368.120 or whatever it is. And then when somebody's answering me, it converts it back down to two meters. So it's just like I'm operating two meters, except I'm really not. Um, and there are some contests that are scored by distance. The microwave contests are all scored by distance, and the uh, ARL 222 megahertz and up which uh, used to be a different event. Uh, they moved it and they made it a, uh, they made it a distance scored contest. Uh, there are a lot of contests going on in Europe and the UK. Uh, our, our contests here on domestically usually allow for moon bounce for those big stations that have it. Uh, however, um, when, you, uh, when you're in Europe, they don't allow moon bounce in any of their contests. Uh, <clears throat> And when you're, if you're going to be operating mobile, if you're going to be uh, moving from uh, one grid to another, uh, I know there are people who say, well, gee, could you spend more time on that grid or you can stop longer there? Uh, typically, I mean, somebody's going to try and, you know, you're going to hand out a lot more grids, uh, a lot more contacts when you get to the next grid, but uh, try to make sure that you cover each of the directions, let people know what you're doing. Some people use, uh, uh, use APRS. Uh, as a separate little, you know, two meter uh, set, set up and they can be followed on maps, but also just using uh, liaison, which is allowed in the uh, ARL uh, VHF contests. You can use a, a region wide linked repeater system uh, or whatever, or you, even uh, a cell phone. You can say, you know, let people know, hey, okay, I'll be here for another 
20 minutes or 30 minutes and then I'm planning to move. So, uh, you know, let's try and get these contacts done. So there's a number of other activities you can do on VHF, UHF. Um, it, before I do that, though, I'm going to just quickly show you, if you don't have a contest that you want to get involved with, we set up a simple one for our area. This is our local club, does something called To the Field, and we do it in place of one of our regular meetings. And we have our local parks, our Summit County Metro Parks that we go to, and we have frequencies that we use. Um, let me bring up the frequency chart here. So we do 2 meter FM, 440 FM, 6 meter FM, 10 meter FM, and then we also have single sideband on um, 10, I'm sorry, on 6 and 10. Uh, all these frequencies are available to technicians only with the exception of the 10 meter FM frequencies or not. So we designed the contest so everyone in the club can take part. And um, it's just a countywide contest that we do. And we have this available uh, throughout the year, though. You can go out and activate the various parks. We use each of the individual parks plus each of the trailheads. Uh, so we have a wide variety of different parks you can work. And we have a list of the entities. So if there's not something that you're doing already in your area, you can add an activity. So uh, back to what else you can do with VHF, UHF. Uh, DMR, DSTAR, we'll talk about those in a moment. We'll talk about FT8. Uh, SOTA and POTUS, Summit's on the air, Park's on the air, uh, K0NR has information on VHF, UHF, SOTAs, uh, MCOM activities, there's tons of Rat Pack sessions on from Thursday nights on uh, MCOM activities with VHF, UHF, same thing with VARA, FM, again, Thursday night presentations, we'll talk about Echolink a little later, uh, fox hunting, hopefully a future Rat Pack presentation. I don't think we've done one on fox hunting, but fox hunting is direction hunting where someone goes out and hides a, a UHF um, or VHF radio and then people track it down. Uh, Earth, Moon, Earth uh, Bounce, uh, there's a Rat Pack presentation on that you can watch. So let's dig in a little deeper into just a few of these. DMR, D-Star, Infusion, uh, also called YSF or CF4M, I'm sorry, C4FM are digital voice modes, not to be confused with analog FM or to be confused with digital sound card modes, which we'll talk about in a few seconds. Each of these digital modes are incompatible with each other on the air. And they, to make it worse, all three of these modes have their own separate outline networking linking system. So they're not compatible between each directly, but there is a way around that. Digital voice modes, um, even if you do not have a digital FM radio, you can get involved via hotspots. These are local radio computer interfaces that allow you to connect or online apps that allow you to uh, access call groups from your computer. So they're involving uh, an internet connection, but they allow you to get involved with these, uh, these types of digital voice if you want to listen and see what's there without investing in a radio to start with. Uh, I have some links here, uh, videos on D-Star, uh, DMR, Fusion, et cetera. We're not gonna have time to really dig into them deeply, but there's a lot of really good resources here you can use if you're interested in those. So the other type of digital is digital sound card modes. These are the modes that come in WSJTX software by Joe Thomas. Um, and there's a number of modes included. And most of these are applicable to the VHF bands. Uh, some of them are also applicable to HF, but many of these were designed originally for VHF or UHF and are still used there. FT8 is probably the most common on F on six meters and two meters uh, that you'll hear, but there's a wide variety, including modes that are used for meter, meteor scatter, aircraft scatter, other types of scatter propagation, even for EME, Earth, Moon, Earth, uh, Earth, Moon, Earth, Moon Bounce. That's Joe Taylor, by the way. Yes, and I said Joe Thomas. Um, Thank you. I have a whole presentation I've done in the past, and there's a slideshow and a video on FT8 and FT4 that you can go to and get much more information on that. For more information on the VHF, UHF specific WSJTX modes, there's a link that takes you back to the uh, WSJTX site and talks specifically about VHF plus features. So you can go through that. If you're already using JT FT8 on HF and you'd like to learn more about it on VHF. Echolink is a software that allows licensed amateur radio stations to communicate with one another over the internet using streaming audio techniques, technology. Now, the, the contact can start with a, a radio or it can start with a computer and 
the thing that's in common is it'll pass through an internet link to go to another person. So you can link repeaters together this way, or it's a way for you to check in remotely to a repeater. So there's a repeater that I can hit. It's about maybe 10 miles from my house here. I can easily get into it. But they also have an echo link on there. So a lot of times during the net, there'll be people checking in from all around the world via echo link, plus the people checking in locally via RF. So echo link is a way to uh, connect repeaters and to have more people check into a repeater using an internet backbone. And I wrote a little quick start guide on echo link that you're welcome to use there. Don't get stuck in a repeater rut. If you're a tech licensee and your entire amateur radio life is confined to one or a few FM repeaters, you need to get out of your rut. And I put together a whole slideshow, and there's also a video on it called Technician's Life Beyond Repeaters. Now, some of it's duplicated in the sessions that Marty and I have been doing over the last couple of weeks, but it's a very good idea for a number of things you can do. For all these things we've been talking about through the last three weeks, you might say, well, that's a really good idea. I wish I knew more about it. One of the things we really strongly suggest is that you get a mentor. That's someone that can help you answer questions and avoid some of the common pitfalls of amateur radio. Uh, a lot of times it's referred to as an Elmer, but I prefer the term mentor uh, because mentors come in a wide variety of people, not just Elmers. Uh, the first place you might look is a local radio club, and I have some links down here for you to find a club if you're not associated with a club in your area. And lots of hams are happy to help newcomers. Some clubs even have formal mentoring programs. Nowadays, you might find your mentor online. There's lots of good websites and mailing lists that are geared towards helping people. I really think one of the most important things is a composite or multiple mentors. The common fallacy is that you can only have one mentor. In fact, many hams have multiple mentors, I, both in person and online. I know when I have questions about antennas, there's one person I go to. When I have questions about power supplies, there's another person I go to. When I have questions about digital modes, there's another person I go to. When I have questions about some things, I rely on certain mailing lists that I'm involved with. So there's a wide variety of ways to get mentored nowadays. So that brings us to the end of our three weeks. And what we'll do now is we'll go ahead and take questions. Now, if you have comments, please hold your comments until later. We're going to take questions first. Raise your hand and we'll be happy to acknowledge you and take questions. Or you can type your questions into the chat and we'd be happy to uh, take them from there. I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing for a moment here so we can see better. Please raise your hand if you have questions. I'll put them into the chat. Well, there's one thing we really need from everyone that was here tonight. We know a lot of you are not just new, new hams starting out. So we need to make sure that you pass on the information about these three week sessions to anyone that's just getting started. So if you're involved in teaching classes, if you're a VE, make sure you pass on the links to people that are just getting started because they don't have good connections to know what's going on. So we want to make sure that they find it, find that information. So these are all going to be available on YouTube. The first two sessions are already there. You can watch them on YouTube. You can watch them on Vimeo. You can download the slideshows. We'll have that link available on the Rat Pack site. And all Again, the links to the slideshow are active. So you, you'll be able to get to these various uh, uh, reference sites uh, that Anthony mentioned. Um, and we, we also got somebody uh, with a question in the chat. Uh, when mobile, how do we feel about operators activating rare grids but not staying long enough to handle a full pileup? Uh, rare, uh, rare is rare, and do we get bruised feelings because we weren't worked? Well, you know, uh, having having done an awful lot of roving over the years, uh, I will tell you that if there's a pileup and people are calling, I'm not leaving. I'm gonna I'm gonna work everybody I can. Uh, there are some folks who try to stay to a particular schedule. Uh, but uh, schedules should be flexible. And you know, I can't tell somebody else how to operate, but if there are people there to work uh, and uh, you know, they're, they're ready to go, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stay there as long as I have to, to work them. And here's the link to um, our Rat Pack link, of course, with the uh, tiny.cc slash Rat Pack list. You can go in there and you can click on the YouTube link with the Vimeo link to watch our previous two sessions, the first one from June 6th, the second one from June 23rd, or not June 23rd, July, let's try that again, July 13th, or tonight's July 20th session. But again, we really need your help in passing this information on to new hams that are just starting out. 
or old hams that are starting out. Yes. Well, I'm sure that some of you have not done all these things. And by attending these sessions, you know you are required to go through the slideshow and click on all the links I provided. It's requirement. <laughs> Dan will check up on you to make sure you did that. Yes. 50 lashes with a wet noodle if you don't. Other questions, please? Thank you all. All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope we got you inspired to go out and do some cool stuff because I'll tell you, it is an absolute blast. Hey, Marty, just a quick, quick observation. I know one thing I noticed. A lot of the people I work in the VHF UHF contest are the same people I work on 160. And I don't know what it is, but they hang out in both ends of the band that I never hear them in between. <laughs> well, uh, actually, uh, yes, there's some of that. Uh, probably the best known in our area here is uh, Robin Critchell, WA6CDR. He's, uh, he's been active uh, as a, as a de-expeditioner on 160 meter contests and so on. And of course, he's very big on the 10 gigahertz microwave. So he's, he's the guy that I typically work uh, in Nevada when he's up on either Highland Peak or Potosi or somewhere like that. Um, and uh, yeah, and he doesn't bother much with the bands in between. <laughs> Uh, you know, some people just like challenges and, uh, frankly, you know, work, working a DX station on 20 meters, a lot of people say, well, that's not really much of a challenge. It's there and there's a zillion people and you gotta, you know, it's all crowded and so on. Uh, 160 and the microwave bands aren't that crowded typically. And so, uh, you have a little more room, a little more chance to, uh, to hear uh, some unusual propagation. Also the propagation on 160 you know, anybody who's worked nighttime bands on HF, you know that, uh, you know, there are some enhancements that occur around uh, the sunrise of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, western, um, easternmost station. And uh, that, that characteristic happens uh, over an even narrower window on 80 meters than it does on 40, and even a narrower one on 160. You may only have five minutes uh, to, uh, to work somebody and then they're gone. But, uh, you know, for a lot of people, that's a challenge and it's a lot of fun. And uh, it's, it's more scheduled than uh, the sporadic E on six meters. But in both cases, you have to be ready to operate quickly and uh, get the job done and, and before the propagation goes away. Yeah, we just need a few more mountains and a lot more operators to get microwave activity in our area. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, there's, there's a group in, uh, that, that goes across... Uh, uh, I think Lake Superior, you know, they, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll line a bunch of people up on one side of the, of the lake and uh, a bunch on the other, and there's good uh, propagation across the water. And then they'll just, everybody will march. Uh, one thing about rovers is you work 10, you move 10 miles or so, you can work somebody again. And they keep working each other back and forth like this. And they may work the same station 24, 25 times, uh, each for a new set of points and contacts. That might get old for me if I was doing that. It might, but you know, uh, sitting, sitting, sitting there checking into a net every week gets old for a lot of people too. So, again, try something different. Now, I'm also I also do the same crazy thing I do on HF as I work most of my VHF UHF QRP five watts. So I do the same same uh, behavior on that band on those bands for the most part also. So. Anything you do on HF, you can do a lot of the same challenges on VHF, UHF. Hey, any other questions? Glad to see Anthony uh, Newby. He got his license May 2022. So, right. Anthony, good luck with your new ham career. With a name like Anthony, you can't go wrong. <laughs> All right. Looks like we're wrapped up. We are. We are. I'd like to put out a call for anybody who's got any ideas. Uh, you've seen some newbie stuff we put out here for all ages and such. We have a wide range. Amateur radio is like a big pizza pie, and it's got all these different slices. And you pick the slice that you want to do, or the, the VHF, repeaters, uh, VXC, whatever it might be. So if you've got an interest, so we haven't covered it yet, or you want it covered more, Get a hold of us. Let us know, and we'll get that covered. We'll, we'll find speakers for you and get that covered for you. If you go to our website, there's a form you can complete there. Um, let me just bring up the website real quick here for everyone.
maybe we'll try that again. So the website is www.ratpack.us. And I can't get my share screen to come up. There we go. So again, ratpack.us, www.ratpack.us. And there's a link right here that says Rat Pack Speaker and Topic Suggestion Form. If you click on that, it'll open up a Google document. You can fill the information out to provide us with ideas on either a speaker that you might want to suggest to us, a topic that you want to suggest, or if you'd like to volunteer to, be, to speak on something that you talk about, you can include that in there. So please go to the website, www.ratpack.us, and click on the link for Speaker Topic uh, Suggestion Form. Okay, and unless we get some more questions, I'm going to start wrapping this up. It's been a great one. Well, these two, these both of these hands that you've been listening to and I have a great amount of experience. Uh, luckily, they're part of our Rat Pack team, and uh, they come up with some real good ideas, and they work great together. I like them when they when they work together on the same presentation. Uh, see here, Barry, you got your hand up. No, it's clapping. Oh, okay. Well, thank, thank you, Barry. <laughs> We're going to have to have different colors for the clap hand and the raise your hand type of a thing. Okay, anybody else out there? Questions? Comments? Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to wrap her up and uh, look forward to seeing you guys well, tomorrow Thursday. So for you who's involved with disaster communications or have an interest in that area, see you tomorrow night. Okay, All right. So Thanks, everybody. So Thanks, Anthony. See you on six meters. Good night. <laughs>